Hey, Roy. Hey, Ross. How are you? I'm good. Uh, great. Uh, well, so to kick things off, I'm Ross Douthat. I'm a senior editor at the Atlantic Monthly, um, and I'm here with... Rui Deshera. I'm a senior fellow at uh, the Center for American Progress and the Century Foundation, a visiting fellow at Brookings, and co-author of a book we might get to later, Ross, uh, The Emerging Democratic Majority. Wow, that's, a, that's an awful lot of stuff. That's, that's pretty impressive. Um, so I guess today we're going to be talking about, we're, we're going to be lifting up a little bit from the uh, nitty-gritty of the presidential election and talking about um, broad trends within the two parties, um, realignments, fractures, and so forth. Um, and maybe we should start off by talking about uh, the landscape of the GOP, which is uh, really incredibly interesting right about now, since we've had three primaries, three different winners. Um, what's, as, as a, uh, I guess, liberal outsider looking in on the GOP coalition, what, what, are, what are your current thoughts about the lay of the land? Well, I mean, I think, broadly speaking, uh, it certainly uh, looks possible that several different candidates could get the nomination. As, uh, you know, you don't need us to tell you out there, uh, you know, it's a wide-open process at this point with those three winners and the three big early primaries. Uh, and it'll be, uh, it's very much in question uh, what's going to happen uh, down the line. And maybe that'll tell us something about what the different forces are within the Republican Party and who's strong and who's not. I guess you'd have to say, for example, that if... Um, uh, you know, Romney gets the nomination and might uh, mean that despite the best efforts of some people to go in a different direction, a more orthodox conservatism uh, will carry the day. If McCain gets the nomination, it might indicate that a more independent, moderate streak in Republicanism is coming to the fore. And if Huckabee gets the nomination, <coughs> which seems quite unlikely to me still, it certainly would, uh, would mean that a certain segment of the coalition was, is still able to dominate. Uh, the party and is willing to, uh, to roll a candidate out there and see what happens, uh, in my view, probably lead to disaster for them, but I guess we'd see. Yeah, I mean, well, I think I think the chances of a Huckabee nomination have gone down dramatically over the last two weeks. Uh, since yeah, yeah. I, I mean, his weaknesses are coming out, so I think you're probably right. But, uh, well, well, but it's interesting because, um, it, well, from my vantage point, um, I guess I'm also the author of a book which is coming out in about uh, five months uh, with a co-author, Ryan Salam, called Grand New Party, um, How mm -hmm. Conservatives Can Win the Working Class and, and Save the American Dream. Um, and so, obviously, with a book with that title, I've watched with interest the progress of the Huckabee campaign because he seems, in part, to have tailored his campaign to try and speak to the concerns of some of the working class voters who Ryan and I argue... Um, are, you know, have, have become a crucial part of the GOP base, and the party hasn't really found a way to necessarily a, uh, address the address their concerns. Um, so it's been interesting to watch Huckabee. Um, I think overall he's been something of a failure in pursuing that constituency, in part because, well, there have been a variety of reasons, a variety of weaknesses in his candidacy, um, I think the main thing is his what you might call his sectarian problem, where he, he he simply hasn't been able to expand his appeal beyond an evangelical base. Um, he comes across, I think, just as too much of the Baptist minister he used to be, and any kind of sort of broad-based uh, working-class conservatism needs to be... <laughs> Well, it, it can't just be an evangelical phenomenon. It needs to be evangelical, right. Catholics. No, don't you think it goes a little beyond that, though? I mean, I'm sure you do. That, uh, despite uh, his sect, you know, in addition to his sectarian problem, he, um, what he's offering to these working class, really white working class voters, isn't all that dramatic, except in a rhetorical sense. He talks a lot about uh, how unfair the system is and how the ordinary working uh, man and woman is getting screwed. But he doesn't really offer them much in terms of. Uh, a different direction other than, I guess, one of his big things, signature things, is uh, the so-called hair tax, which uh, actually isn't particularly fair and wouldn't do them much good. So he hasn't really matched uh, his rhetorical ploys with, with much of substance that I think could, could possibly excite people too much, even in the Republican Party. So I think he's a poor messenger for uh, what, uh, what you guys have in mind. Well, well, sure. And I mean, this is, this is one of, one of the... Um you know, along with his sectarian problem, the, the fact that Huckabee doesn't seem all that interested in matters of policy substance, or if he is interested in, in policy detail, he almost seems a little bit um, naive, naive or gullible. You know, he, he adopted the fair tax because he read Neil Bortz's fair tax book and thought it sounded like a good idea, which 
in a way, bespeaks a you know an impressive curiosity on his part. On the other hand, if you're trying to pick someone you know to to run for president, you want someone who, after they read a book by Neil Bortz, then maybe goes to a few other people and says, "Hey, what do you think about this fair tax idea?" Um, and yeah, yeah, Rob, this is a groovy idea. Let's run with it, man. This is great. Right. Yeah, no, it does bespeaks a certain lack of seriousness, I think. Yeah, but I mean, this is a problem for for the Republican Party more more generally. I think is you know th- there's an absence of policy substance beyond the you know the policies that originally brought Ronald Reagan to power. And what 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 you've seen in the Republican Party and the conservative movement over the last few months as this as it's become clear that this would be such a fractured and divided primary field is a tremendous resistance on the part of um, I guess particularly the, well you'd almost call it the movement establishment there, there used to be a Republican establishment and I think now it's fair to say that there's a conservative establishment that consists of you know talk radio um, parts of national review um, you know and some of the conservative movement organizations Americans for tax reform and so on and you've got tremendous resistance to, I mean, particularly the Huckabee and McCain candidacies, but also the, just a resistance to the idea that, you know, the era of Ronald Reagan might be over and it might be time to think about something new. I mean, Newt, Newt Gingrich, who's, you know, his movement bona fides ought in a way to be unimpeachable, you know, he came out with a comment, something like, well, you know, the Reagan era was over, it's in the past, and he was immediately hammered by Rush Limbaugh up and down um, up and down for saying this, and you know, it's yes. from the from the point of view as you know, as a conservative who's who's interested in the future rather than the past of conservatism in America. It, I mean, it's it's kind of embarrassing. I mean, you know, you, you get some of this on the Democratic side. Obviously, for a long time, you had real FDR worship, and then you had real Kennedy worship, which you know, I think was much less justifiable than the, than the FDR worship. But I mean, it is now twenty years since Ronald Reagan left office, and. It, as I, it might have been David Frum, but you know, someone was saying, imagine if the, the Democratic candidates were sitting around talking about, you know, well, what would what would uh, you know Jimmy Carter or Tip O'Neill do about X, Y, or Z? I mean, Republicans would be laughing at them. And I think that the sort of Reagan worship has, you know, it's 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 somewhat yeah. laughable. Now they're they're still in denial. Let's face it. I mean, that's why it's probably more. Um useful to interpret these uh, currents in the Republican Party that seem a little bit different on social issues and, uh, you know, a few other things uh, that are coming out in this this particular and economic, uh, the economic populism we mentioned is more a symptom of a party that's starting, you know, kind of falling apart before it needs to put itself back together rather than a party that's ready to coalesce around a new vision. I mean, people are, are breaking off from the consensus, but the consensus is still quite strong. Uh, well, the movement conservatives you're talking about are still quite strong, and I don't think they're going to let the party do much of a turn very quickly. I think it's going to take a few more uh, bludgeonings around the ears before uh, before that's likely to, to be able to obtain. I mean, this no, tells I, us a little bit about who might break off in the future and the issues around which they might break off, and certainly tells us things are in flux, but I, don't, I think it also tells us uh, the way things are going, that things are not enough in flux, that things are going to change very, very dramatically and very fast within the Republican coalition. Well, sure. And I mean, when you look at the history of the Democratic coalition, it, it was, you know, what, 18 to 20 years between um, the sort of initial crisis in the Democratic Party in 68 and 72, and then the election of Bill Clinton, which I think we can look at as sort of the beginning of the crisis coming to an end. Um, and in, I, I imagine that you know everything happens faster now in politics for a variety of reasons, and I I don't think that conservatives should expect that they're headed for you know 20 years of of stabbing each other in the back and feuding in the wilderness. But by the same token, it does yeah it's it's any kind of any kind of post Reagan post Bush realignment within conservatism is going to take some time, and there aren't really there aren't coherent new visions of what conservatism should be. Okay. Yes, no, there are. Why don't you talk a little bit about what you think, um, you know, uh, how that change might come about, what vision of conservatism you think could plausibly supplant the current one? I mean, if you were going well, to advise are... a presidential candidate now or in the future of a, a vision to lay forth before the American people, what would that be? Well, I think there are a few competing um, competing sort of proto-visions for, for conservatism going forward, and one of them is... 
I guess you'd call it a more sort of straightforward libertarian vision, um, and that's what you get from Brian Sager, who's a, a young a, a young writer for the New York Sun, among other places. Um, and he yeah, wrote, wrote book, the elephant in the room. Right, the elephant in the room, and and this is the argument that you know the GOP has become a captive of its sort of southern evangelical base. Um, it's going to start losing. It's already lost western states like California. It's going to start losing. Um, yet more in, in the Mountain West and so on. It's going to lose libertarian votes, um, and it needs to get back to its libertarian roots, its sort of Goldwaterist roots, pushing for small government and individual liberty and become less moralistic. So that's, that's one vision. Um, mm -hmm. Another vision, I think, is suggested by, by uh, David Frum in his new book, Come Back. Um, and I, I, I've been trying to find the right words to describe this vision. I called it um, somewhat centrist and technocratic uh, in a blog post, and um, David Frum challenged me on that a little, and I haven't yet responded to him. But I think that that's a fairly accurate vision that it's essentially a it, it emphasizes as the you know the central planks of conservatism are support for um, you know free trade and economic growth and maintaining American competitiveness economically and American hegemony politically so those those would be the central goals and then secondarily and here's where I, I think Frum's ideas overlap with some of my own you need to do more to get the American middle and working classes to buy in to um, this pursuit of competitiveness and hegemony, which I think I think from recognizes rightly that you know part of part of the uh, the, the effects of globalization and and so on are you know disquiet, discontent at home, um, stagnating wages, um, a growing gap between rich and poor, and so forth. And so you need some new policies aimed at middle and working class voters. Um, and but in, in a sense, there the goal is to you know. The the cart um, the, the the cart and the horse it's it's one of, it's one of those metaphors but the idea is like you know the cart important, horse is what the heck you know? right the, the essential the essential That's goals the, are competitiveness and hegemony and the second and uh, as a second order matter this requires um, doing more for the American middle and working classes and then from so it's also, like a slightly more sensible conservatism but I sense right. you feel that's not enough well I mean well and and I I think that. Um, David, he also talks about sort of at both. He goes in a slightly Brian Sager style direction, urging conservatives to moderate somewhat on social issues, and he goes mm -hmm. in um, a essentially a straightforwardly liberal direction on global warming, urging that conservatives essentially try and adopt a green conservatism with support for a carbon tax and so on. And I think all all of these are sort of you know, I, I think centrist and technocratic is a reasonable way to look at it. Um, Would McCain be a candidate who sort of like fit into that mold? I think actually I either think. either McCain or Romney, I think in different ways. Or are, Romney. Are pl well, I think the Romney who, you know, the the authentic Romney, if yeah, such a thing so can be. Who knows what the real Romney is? He changes too fast, man. Well, right, but Maybe that, he but, was lying back then. And but now what he's is the truth? Who knows? But what is what is centrism if not you know the ability to move in one direction you know one day and another direction another? I mean, I think Indeed Romney so. uh, Fromm's vision is kind of a vision for you know business class Republicans who want to keep the current coalition together um, mm -hmm. while also moving the party you know into the 21st century or what have you. And, and as such, I think okay. it's I think it's a a good. Fit for a Romney. I think McCain. I mean, McCain is a much more sui generis um, figure. I think, and I feel like what McCain represents is well. I mean, it's it's McCain. It's you know, it's his own constellation. I mean, what I think McCain goes actually much further in a you know, just being a liberal direction on an on an awful lot of issues, and it's it's hard such to imagine as? Uh, such as campaign finance reform, um, uh -huh. such such Integration? as. Such as immigration, certainly um, mm -hmm. from right, and that, and that's where from from is much um, you know part of, part of from's prescription for reducing working class anxiety is continuing the conservative commitment to you know patrolling the borders, reducing illegal immigration, and so on. Whereas McCain is much more you know yeah. I, mean, part of, I mean part of and, and this is why but if the prescription for uh, allaying the fears of the white working class is uh, doing a bit more to control the borders and try to 
get the country more competitive. It's not well. No, I mean it. That is a winning program to get like two thirds of the vote of the white working class, which is really well, what you need, kind of. Right? From, I mean, from, you've got to have, as you argue, and we, you know, I argued uh, way back when, and I still argue today. It's my story. I'm sticking to it. The Republicans need a super majority of the white working class to be right. viable as a coalition at this point. So, how does that kind of policy translate into uh, into those kind of votes? Well, I think Frum does go a little further, um, I should say, on tax policy and t talking about some of the same things that, that uh, Ryan and I talk about in our book in terms of shifting the GOP's focus from across-the-board income tax cuts to a more tar more targeted tax reforms that, um, you know, change and ease the tax burden, particularly on families in the middle and, and lower-income areas and so on. I think that 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 is, and this is something that Ramesh Panuro of National Review has suggested as well, and I think it's it's a natural fit for the party in certain ways, and it gets you a little further, certainly, towards uh, than, than just, you know, sealing the borders and being being competitive. And, yeah. well, and what about the some other programs, Scott, help us all? What about health care? I mean, well, is health care part of this? Um, I, I mean, yes, uh, from says health care is part of this, but... You know, and I, I don't. I don't have the book in front of me, so I don't. I don't want. <laughs> well, what about um, your program? Well, our our pro all right. So our program. Um, mm -hmm. So so the book doesn't come out for six more months. So I hopefully don't well, have we to can, nail, we can, uh, nail uh, down quite yet. Plug it here, though, right? What what our program is? Well, I mean, our our program is, you know, it's it's similar in its broad outlines to Frum's, I would say, but it's I it it spends more more time focusing on particularly on the middle and working classes fortunes and less time focusing on the broader issues of America's position in the world. So even when mm -hmm. the policies are similar, the, the emphases are different. Um, mm -hmm. But but essentially, I mean, what what we're trying to do, I think one way to look at it is, you know, a policy agenda for social conservatism broadly understood um, that, that takes you beyond the sort of classic social conservative emphasis on um, a, abortion in particular and sort of sexual politics more generally towards... Mm -hmm. Reforming the welfare state in directions that make it easier for people to form and sustain strong families, which I think is, okay. and this is something Frum talks about as well, but I think that, you know, this, go, going forward, um, from the point of view of conservatism, the biggest, the, the biggest challenge to the right going forward is going to be, I think, the continued fragmentation of the American family and concomitant to that, the rising demand, which you already see, for a more European-style welfare state to yeah. essentially protect people against, um, you know, the the buffetings that come with higher divorce rates and particularly higher rates of uh, out of wedlock out of wedlock births illegitimacy. Um, so, you know, so, so our policy agenda ranges across um, a variety of fields, um, beginning with sort of ta various kinds of tax reforms focused either on income taxes or on shifting uh, payroll taxes around to, uh, you know, to, to, to privilege, in a way, the interests of um, working and middle-class families, um, and then expands to, I mean, it, it, we, we take a fairly frummy in line on immigration, arguing that, you know, fr from, from the point of view, both from the point of view of the interests of uh, native-born Americans and from the point of view of the interests of recent immigrants themselves, it's in the, it's in America's interest to um, reduce the inflow, sl slow the inflow of of immigrants in order to um, give essentially more time and space for the existing immigrant population to assimilate. And that, yeah. you know, our, well, well, beyond our, the immigration piece, though, I mean, it sounds like it's mostly stuff about the tax structure. Do I have that right? No, it's well, it, and then no has that's. <laughs> That's only there's one more. chapter. Wait, there's more. No, there's there's more. Um, no, uh, then 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 we move on. This is sort of a, I guess, turning into a kind of a pricey of the book. Um, you know, we we also have some other small bore suggestions um, on family family friendly policy issues, ranging from um, a renewed, you know, these sound like small things, but a renewed push to improve America's transportation infrastructure, um, increase both telecommuting and shortened commuting times, sort of essentially focus, focusing on quality of life issues that affect uh, working and middle class families. Um, we, we also make, you know, suggestions having to do with um, channeling, you know, right, right now there are credits for daycare and so on, and 
and creating credits and voucher programs and so on that make it easier for either mothers or fathers to stay home with the children. So, so that's all sort of within the direct family-friendly rubric. Um, then, then you move on to to the issues of healthcare, where we make a couple a couple separate suggestions. Um, but the sort of the sort of short-term proposal is um, essentially a combination of um, some of the existing conservative proposals having to do with the tax code, uh, which which yeah. will, um, join to something something along the lines of the kind of reinsurance programs um, for catastrophic uh, medical expenses that were proposed on both the left and the right in different forms um, a few years ago. John Kerry and Bill Frist made proposals along these lines, but it, uh, essentially trying to, on the one hand, um, you know, take take the correct conservative insight that you need to get people having more skin in the game with basic medical expenditures to drive down costs, but joining that mm-hmm. to recognition that, you know, catastrophic care, um, and, you know, is, is, is where the real bite is being taken out, and it's the thing that prevents people often from getting coverage. And yeah, yeah. Government Isn't there sort of a, some similarities between this and uh, Kerry's program in 2004? No, no there, there was a big piece of his program. There, there, there are, in fact. Yeah, yes. yeah. But you guys are definitely not, you know, you're still like make the sign of the cross or whatever when people mention universal health care. You're still not into that, right? I mean, this is, well, this well, is a pretty I, complicated mix of, of uh, changes to the tax structure and something for catastrophic. I mean, this is going to be... Well, like well, a lot I, I mean, of your changes, think, to be honest, it sounds pretty complicated. Do you worry that this sort of uh, basket of programs is going to be hard to put forward as like uh, a thematic organizing principle for? Oh no, I think uh, that that's, uh, that's, no? that's 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 I, I think that that's a problem. Though I mean, and anything other than simply, you know, um, single payer sing, single payer health health care is is going to be more complex and and therefore. At a certain point, perhaps harder to sell. I think. I mean, I think we still make the sign of the cross against universal health care in the sense that, um, you know, we we still share the conservative assumption that, in the particularly in the American context, the kind of uh, cost overruns that you're going to get from anything like a European style program are so enormous as to make it unsustainable. That, you know, the way the way that American the way that Americans currently relate to their health care. Um, if you give them, you know, Medicare for all or whatever you want to call it, um, you know, mm-hmm. it's going to be eating up sixty to seventy percent of the federal budget. Um, so, so we're yeah, so we're looking we're looking for looking for ways. I mean, we also though have a longer term bet, which is, you know, again, this is I, I'd say very heterodox from a conservative point of view, but we do argue that in the long term, it's possible that as um, you know, uh, genetic testing improves and so on, you may reach a point where traditional insurance models simply don't work anymore because insurance companies will just know too much about the likelihood of people getting diseases. And at that point, we, we propose a, a sort of modified version of um, a, a plan that um, Brad DeLong floated at one point where you are envisioning, um, a, envisioning a system in which um, all sort of small bore expenses are are, are paid for out of pocket, and all catastrophic expenses beyond a certain point are are covered by by the government. Mm-hmm. Which okay. does which does so which does sort but, of a, which does push you much more in a you know you know in a in a universalizing direction. I think in the short term, yeah, well, that's one, pretty far down the road. One one thing we would say is that, and we I don't think we explicitly say this in the book, but in the, in in the short term. Um, I think that there's sort of a division among conservatives between people who want to use the tax code to try and push us towards universality, um, you know, giving giving people tax rebates and you know, vouchers and so on. That, not vouchers, but 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 uh, tax credits that allow them to mm-hmm. purchase health care and try and really drive down the number of uninsured people versus um, try, trying to use different mechanisms to try and make health care more affordable um, and stable for people who already have it. Um, and I think we're more in the latter camp. You're more um, in the latter camp. I mean, in a way, a lot of what you're saying sounds like a somewhat more liberal version of Frumism, or Frumism is a right wing. You know. Yeah. No, uh, I say I say our short term health care vision. God. Yeah. Our our short term health care vision is a, you know, a it's it's a it's a com- combination of the existing conservative proposals with um, some proposals that that do involve. The government taking more of a role in catastrophic care, which is more, um, yeah, more liberal on that count. Yeah. Well, let's let's assume that your ideas are good ones. 
for a moment. That sounds, sounds um, like that's that good they, they would be, at any rate, a great set of ideas for the Republican coalition to embrace. I mean, how the heck does that happen at this point? I mean, how, well, I don't, how I don't think... How much water has to go under the bridge before that's likely to get taken too seriously? I mean, would you agree with my proposition that it ain't going to happen now, that we're still too far away from that in terms yes. of the way the Republican coalition uh, is structured, and they probably need to be kicked around the block a few more times? It sounded like you did from stuff you said earlier. No, so I, I... How I, bad I, does it have I to get so. before it gets better? Well, I mean, I think I think conservatism is going to kind of, you know, it, pr- presumably, and, you know, again, we can... We're going to talk about the Democrats in a minute, and so a, a, a lot, a lot can happen on either side. But assuming current sure. trends continue, assume, assuming conservatives, um, you know, continue to not have the House and Senate, maybe the Democrats build up almost a supermajority in the Senate. Assuming Republicans lose the White House, I mean, I think, mm-hmm. I think everything does happen faster now, and certainly by 2012, you'll have Republican politicians who are open to. Dramatic shifts, and I think I mean I think you you mm-hmm. probably, you saw this to a limited extent in in the late 1990s with George W. Bush. I mean he didn't go as far certainly as some of the things that we or even David Frum are proposing. But uh, Bush in in his 2000 campaign did make a pretty dramatic break in certain respects with the conservatism of the 1990s, and conservatives went along with that in part because he you know was. Um, well, in part because he was endorsed by the establishment, anointed by the establishment, wasn't running an insurgent campaign, in part because he made, you know, statements on tax cuts and so on, judges that um, sort of kept, you know, pro- promises that the base could trust. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I think there, there was an openness then, and I think after, after an electoral defeat in 08, there would be an openness again. I think the real question, though, is, you know, how, how far can you take this? I think Bush, in certain respects, tried to take it um, a ways and, and was unsuccessful. I mean, a lot of that was just his administration's utter incompetence. But, um, but, but you do wonder, I, I think you can also imagine a future in which, you know, the conservative movement becomes kind of comfortable being a minority, a sort of honorable small government minority that, you know, they look back on the Bush years and say, well, when we, when we controlled all three branches of government, we lost our principles. Um, it's better to keep our principles and just sort of try and serve as a right. check on I would the see that as a problem, actually. I do think that'll be a current that better to, to fight and lose in a noble cause than to fight the wrong fight. No, absolutely. Um, and, and, I, and I think, you know, and, and I don't think, you know, I, I, I don't think that that's an unreasonable position to take if you are, you know, a true sort of small government purist and, you know, to, to, to just say, all right, we're going to get um, 40 to 45 percent of the vote in bad years and sometimes we'll be able to win the presidency on national security issues and, and so on. But right. sure. uh, but on the other hand, I mean, I think that, you know, that ultimately the pressures of American politics being what they are you know, someone will emerge who wants to lead the party out of the wilderness and people will rally around them. It just, you know... Isn't it more likely, though, I mean, just sort of thinking it by analogy to the Democrats. I mean, you had Mondale rolled out there in 84, you know, sort of sticking to the uh, to the uh, standard liberal prescriptions to some extent and the standard mm-hmm. uh, coalition, what was left of it. And he got totally clobbered. But isn't it like they turned it around in 1988? They, 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 I mean, the recurrence have changed, but they nominated... The Democrats nominated somebody in 88, the Dukakis, who was a slightly improved version of Mondale. Um, right. I mean, he was sort of like trimming away some of the obvious stupid parts of the Mondale candidacy and presenting himself as someone who would be a viable choice to, to voters. And it really didn't work. Right, no, and the sort of, and the reformist um, so, you know, in the party. A, it takes a pretty, you know, a substantial degree of change to get from the kind of candidate and candidacy or campaign you're likely to have in 2008, we think, to a real change candidate for, for, for that party. Um, yeah, no, the only, the only thing I would say against that is just that, you know, the way the media is now, the way political institutions are now, I, I do suspect that change happens faster and that if you re- rewound the 80s and played it again now, the Democrats they might nominate a Mondale. They probably wouldn't nominate a Dukakis. The pressure to win would be too great. But, but mm-hmm. yeah, no, I, I, I think it's look, it's totally possible that the GOP is headed for a long period in the wilderness. And it's also totally possible that there are, you know, it, I, I think, you know, what Ryan and I are proposing is I think it is a logical direction for the party to take. But there are, as, you know, there are other logical visions the party could pursue. Mm-hmm. 
So, yeah. So, is there a so, politician out there who you, you like, who think he's pretty close to to this kind of vision for the Republican Party? I mean, a major politician? I, I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, people talk about Tim Pawlenty in uh, mm-hmm. Minnesota, and I think that he's, you know, sort of, I guess you could say, shown promise. I mean, he's the guy who coined the term Party of Sam's Club so, that we right. used as the title for the article that was the basis for for the book. Um, so, you know, so, so there's figures like him. I mean, I think a Mike, a Mike Huckabee figure... You can imagine, and I, I, I sort of doubt that this will happen, but you can imagine if the Republicans lose this year, Mike Huckabee, well, kind of doing what John Edwards did after after 2004, where he sort of went went out and spent the next couple of years talking to really smart people. I mean, in Edwards's case, it was really smart people on the left. In Huckabee's case, maybe it's smart people on the right, and sort of reinvents him as a candidate himself as a candidate of of ideas, I mean, as you know, Ed, Ed, it's obviously a very different scenario because Edwards was mm-hmm. identifying himself with the party's left, and Huckabee would sort of be identifying himself with the part, the Republican Party's left. But but you can you you could imagine. I mean, I think Huckabee is sort of like the 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 unformed prototype for a kind of Sam's Club politics, um, but but not you know not anywhere anywhere close yet. I mean. And, but then, you know, the really the, the other Republican politicians are much more in a very traditional moderate Republican stripe, uh, you know, of, mm-hmm. of Arno, Arnold Schwarzenegger and so on. And right. and that's sort of what McCain is, too, where you're, you know, liberal on social issues and sort of fiscally conservative, but ultimately Me Too-ish um, on issues like health care and so on. And, you know, that I, – I, I, don't, I don't see – I can see that being a winning vision in some places for the Republican Party. I don't see much point in having a party like that. I mean, I think it's 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 bad for the well, two-party system. Well, it might be system. easier to win. I mean, I think that would be the logic, right? I mean, if right. if in fact these kinds of programs and this kind of approach is congenial to a very strong majority of the American people at this point, well, then you've got to offer a version of the same thing in a lot of these areas. I mean, maybe more market-oriented, maybe. Uh, yeah, no, bureaucratic, sure. maybe uh, argue. You know, you would argue it would be more effective. I mean, right idea, good idea, bad execution. I mean, those Democrats they just screw up big government programs because they love big government too much. We we understand that some of this stuff needs to be done, but we'll make sure it's done in a way that isn't wasteful and efficient, and lines the pockets of uh, the wrong people and promotes bureaucracy that would control every facet of your daily life. Right. So that would be the argument, I think. Yeah, no, and, and and you know it might it it's it's the argument that elected Dwight Eisenhower. Um, it's it seems to me that it's ultimately the, the great it's Dwight a, Eisenhower. He's he's the icon. Where are the Dwight Eisenhower? Republicans? Well, but he's the, he's the icon. But it's not like you know the Republican Party in the 1950s had a had a really sustained you know a sustained major. If, if basically, if you're looking to win some elections in an era when the other party is on the ascendancy, then that's then that's a good way to go about it. If you're looking mm-hmm. to actually build a majority, though, you do ultimately need to offer some kind of alternative. Uh, so, so well, let's okay. so let's talk. So we'll let's see what let's, happens. Well, speaking of building a majority, so let's let, let me let me now turn around and grill you about this. You know, the state of the the, the state of the Democratic race, um, and then the state of the party going forward. So, what, how, how do you see things shaping up? There's been a lot of talk, obviously, about division suddenly within the Democratic field between. Obama and Clinton and, you know, divisions of race and gender and so on uh, showing up in voting patterns, but that hasn't been matched, I would say, by any real ideological division. So do, do you think that this is sort of a temporary tempest in a teapot and ultimately the Democrats are pretty united right now, or what do you think? Yeah, I guess I'd put it in the uh, tempest in a teapot category. Uh, I think there was some... Um sort of uh, exuberance on the part of some of the surrogates in the campaigns. I, I actually don't think it was, like, hugely plotted on either side to bring up some of these issues. And I think it spun a little bit out of control, and both candidates realized that this is probably not the way they want to have the nomination uh, fought out, um, and they decided to stop it. And I, my anticipation is they'll be fairly successful. I think there'll be little eruptions of it here and there as the uh, as the nomination campaign continues, but I don't expect it to to dominate in a way it, it did the coverage for, for a few days there. So, And I think fundamentally uh, Democrats are really unusually united around 
sort of the basic things they want the party to do. And you can see that in the way that the candidates come across. They've got different sort of thematic things they try to hit. Obviously, Obama says, I can bring the country together. I'll bring independents, moderate Republicans. We need to transcend the divisions of the past. It's time for a new way of thinking. It's time to stop the partisan food fight in Washington, etc. cetera. Um, but his policies, you know, are pretty similar to Hillary Clinton's, which are pretty similar to John Edwards. Sure, there are some differences. Edwards a little bit to the left. Obama's arguably a little bit to the right on some of these policy issues. But what they're trying to do in the general policy ballpark they're trying to occupy is really broadly similar, and Democrats are fine with that. But So, so do you see any, I, I guess, prospects for, um, I guess, real, real splintering on the Democratic side? I mean, it was only a few years ago that the party seemed to be roughly where the GOP is now over issues of foreign policy. You had, you know, Peter Beinart trying to read Michael Moore out of the party and, and, mm-hmm. and, and so on. I mean, is all, is, all that just, is all that just gone, do you think? Well, it's not gone. And it's not forgotten. But I think that a general view of most people in the Democratic Party uh, is that we get a Democrat into office and they will figure out a way to get us out of Iraq. It might not be tomorrow might take some time, but their fundamental commitment on the Iraq war, for example, will be different than the Bush administration, and the intent will be broadly similar between the the three candidates. That's not to say that once somebody gets into office, if they temporize too much, and it's sort of like, well, McCain said we'll be there for 100 years, Uh, we as Democrats realize we can only be there for 50, Um, I think that would cause some problems, but my anticipation would be no matter which of those folks uh, becomes president, if the Democrats succeed, uh, they will, in fact, craft a way to you know, gradually withdraw from Iraq. Um, and I think people will be you know, good with that. So, yeah, I don't, I don't anticipate uh, huge fights about but, I mean, the party. The Democrats are very focused on getting their guys elected and then you know, support, you know, making sure that, that things actually change in the country. And if... There are some disagreements about how exactly to make that happen and how fast to make that happen. I think those can be absorbed pretty well, at least for the first few years. But, but I mean, uh, well, I, I generally agree with you, but let's just to, just to push on this a little bit. I mean, clearly, okay. clearly there is a real, <clears throat> excuse me, dem- demographic divide between the supporters of Clinton and the supporters of Obama with, with uh, you know, Upscale, upscale Democrats being much more likely to support Obama, downscale voters being much more likely to support Hillary, and so on. And it does seem like on at least some of the big issues that right now Democrats are all united on going forward, like you know global warming, for instance, that that demographic divide could be the basis of an ideological divide once the rubber meets the road and things have to start getting done. I mean, like, you know, with, with global warming, the obvious case is, well, what do downscale whites who would, you know, theoretically be hit hardest by some kind of, you know, restrictions on industry, uh, you know, a rising price of gasoline because of a carbon tax, what have you, you know, do, do they start to become more skeptical of what, you know, the upscale liberals want to do to save the earth? Right, though, in, in theory, um, all of the candidates are committed to uh, trying to move down the path to alternative energy, reducing our energy dependence, right. and trying to do something about uh, global warming. And right, and they're all gases. committed to... They've been sort of entertaining broadly similar policies along those lines, and nobody is proposing at this point an immense gas tax. Uh, no, they're all united on, ca- on cap and trade. But, but right, I mean, cap, cap and, and trade, trade... Sure. But cap and trade is effectively... You know, it's effectively going to function as some form of um, <coughs> tax right, on but effectively base. functioning as some sort of a, a tax is not the same as you go down to the pump and suddenly it's 50 cents higher. So uh, my, and my sense is, I mean, if you look at the polling data, and we'll see how this plays out in reality, people are pretty supportive of doing a variety of things to combat global warming, and they appear to be willing to make at least some sacrifices. So my sense is that if it's not too um, outrageous and too sudden and too obvious, I think people can absorb some of these shifts without getting too bent out of shape. Now, that said, I think you're right that it could be a potential 
you know, sort of it will be it will be perceived and felt differently among certain elements of the Democratic coalition. And say, downscale voters who are part of the Democratic coalition will logically uh, be hit a little bit more by this, and perhaps could feel potentially differently about this than the more upscale members of the coalition. Again, the question these things obviously is how big the bite is going to be, how that's going to be perceived, and whether the two elements, uh, the two parts of the coalition really would get at loggerheads with each other because of that. Again, I don't see that as happening too far too fast, but I don't want to say that everything's going to be sweetness and light. I just think that for the kinds of things the Democratic president is likely to try to do in the first few years, I think these conflicts will be pretty manageable. Um, but, of course, the problem with any coalition, once it comes together, there are different interests, and those different interests can come out around a variety of policy issues, and depending on how they're handled, can cause splits. So, you know, any coalition has within it the seeds of its destruction, and I don't want to minimize that. Well, right, but no, I mean, I, you know, I'm, I'm I, I guess, a, a, a pessimist from a conservative point of view, an optimist from the Democrats' point of view about the Democratic Party's sort of short-term, long-term prospects, um, and you know, my my sense is that th there was the potential for a real democratic crack up over the war in Iraq and over the war on terror more broadly. But it's hard to see what what the equivalent would be that would wh essentially what the equivalent of the war in Iraq would be that would do to the Democrats what Bush's presidency has done to the Republicans. I mean, the Republicans were riding pretty high about four years ago. You know, their coalition looked reasonably strong. But then you had, you know, George W. Bush became sort of tied to an enormously unpopular, seemingly unsuccessful foreign war. It seems pretty unlikely that something like that will happen on, on Hillary Clinton or Barack Obama's watch, um, if only because so much energy is going to be expended trying to get out of Iraq. Um, so, so really, I mean, yeah, the, the, only, the only obvious things that seem like they might reshuttle the political landscape are something like you know a catastrophic terror attack on American soil or something, which obviously can't be can't be ruled out, but it isn't sort of part of the natural run of coalition politics. Yeah, and um, you know, or as you point out, it's at least possible that some economic related issues could uh, exacerbate the class divide in the Democratic Party. Whether action and climate change is such a flashpoint, I guess I have my doubts. Um, in fact, you could argue the other way, that there are some issues out there that have the potential to really weld the coalition together and expand it, like health care. Well, right. No, and this is, this is if, if I mean, Democrats... If Bill Crystal's uh, memo was correct in 1993 about right. if we don't stop the Democrats in health care, uh, you know, we're in, we're in a world of hurt. Probably even more true now. Probably, although the, the only thing I would say there is that I mean, people like to compare health care to Social Security and say, well, just as <clears throat> Social Security built the initial lasting post-FDR Democratic majority, a new health care system could do the same. I, mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do think that, you know, given... I mean, Social Security essentially replaced um, nothing. There was no national pension system, really, before... Uh, before before Social Security came along, no no old age old age system. Um, any kind of health care reform the Democrats pass is going to replace an existing system that people you know people are dissatisfied with, but they aren't wildly unhappy with. I mean, if you ask mo are most Americans, are you satisfied with their health care? Most Americans still say yes. So even if you e even if you imagine a world in which the Democrats pass a reasonably popular program that you know either gets you closer to or to universal coverage and improves stability and so on. I, I have a hard time imagining, I don't know, I think obviously it gives the Democrats an advantage. I, I have a hard time imagining that it creates the kind of built-in gratitude among the, you know, in, in the average voter that Social Security seemed to create in the 1930s. I think you yeah, can well, imagine... Well, certainly... Mm -hmm. I, I certainly just think you can question whether... Oh, go ahead, Ross, sorry. Oh, no, I just, yeah, I just think all I was saying, yeah, I, I think it's it may change people's sympathies, but I feel like it's more likely to change them around the margins, which is okay. why well, you, you, you almost wonder from a conservative point of view, purely, purely strategically, having nothing to do with issues of substance, whether conservatives ought to be hoping that the Democrats pass some kind of health care plan to take the issue off the table. Because right now, it, it, it's clearly the Democrats' best domestic policy issue, I would say. 
Yeah. Well, I'd say spread that one around. That you know, it's best to just get it over with. Uh, I'd be fine with that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. No, I guess I, I do believe that. I guess I do believe that it would be quite a boost uh, for the Democrats if a, you know a successful program was was passed and implemented. Will it be on the scale of Social Security? Uh, I, I think that's pretty hard to say. But I think that if a system of you know healthcare coverage was implemented in the United States, that uh, you know would pe- make people pretty sure they were going to be able to get healthcare coverage no matter what. But that um, retain the amount of choice that we have today. Uh, and, in fact, gave choice to the people who uh, didn't have coverage or couldn't get coverage under the current system. So you still got choice, you got coverage, and if it did, uh, you know, made some impact on uh, controlling some costs, um, and people felt that. I mean, you put those three things together. Well, well, sure. I think it's a pretty big boost for the average person. Well, yes. And particularly for these downscale whites, right? Well, right, but that's... A problem area for the Democratic coalition. But I mean, but but that's the whole problem with healthcare reform is that you're trying. I mean, what what you're describing is essentially a, a a perfect world in which you know you're you're containing costs and universalizing coverage and making you know making it stable and so on. And in in reality, you would end up with with trade offs where people over time would have presumably fewer choices than they have now, and over time. You know, either either costs would go up, or you'd move to some kind of rationing, and so on. And I I, I don't mean to take well, you know, I, obviously I mean, that's some, a long some, policy some, argument, but I don't actually agree that that's the necessary trade-off. Which okay. Way? Well, you know, we'll 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 find out. We'll see. The proof she is in the pudding, but uh, um, again, if the Democrats can get something like that, well, certainly if they can, in all those three areas, if they produce a positive effect, or at least in the choice uh, area, uh, no no change. Um, uh, even, a, you know, it could be, so long as it's, you know, macroscopic, we can see it, people can feel it, uh, that's, a, that's, a, that's a big deal. Or you could argue that you take those three things and it nets out a positive, uh, even if there's some uh, negatives in one area. Uh, well, and it's still good. My sense is, I mean, a lot of it comes down to, this, this is part of the reason why you're a conservative and I'm not. You probably believe that if we try to do that, uh, the trade-offs will work in such a way that it'll be a net negative for uh for the American people. And now, if you really believe that, then maybe your point about how the, the Republicans should seek to get this off the table right away is actually correct. Because not only if you get it off the table, it reduces the effect of the political issue right now. Then they try to implement this crazy I, big government idea of socialized health care, and it comes a cropper, and it actually like has a net negative effect on people in the health care area. And then you've got a great issue to run on. So. I mean, yeah, I'm thinking well, about it. It seems like the logic of it is, yeah, go for it, baby. You know, you got our votes. Uh, let's pass universal health care and watch you fall flat on your face. Well, but don't well, feel crystal to, about that if you get a to, chance. Well, but to flip, yeah, but to flip, flip my own argument around. The problem with that is that uh, you, you can imagine, you know, a, a new system is implemented. It doesn't work very well. But then, you know, and this is this is the standard Democratic line. Whenever something isn't working well, the Democrats say, "Well, right, because we need to spend more money on it." And the Republicans won't let us spend more money on it. And you can imagine, sort of, this the very ineffectiveness of such a system actually being, at least for a while, an arrow in the Democrats' quiver, and a way for them to say to the Republicans, "You know, we, you know, the, this system exists. It's not working because the Republicans won't, you know, agree to fund it, and so on." Right. Right. Which, which, which tends to be scenario. how how these debates often, I think, play out in 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 uh, you know your. I mean, it, it, once once you create this you know national health care of some sort as the standard, then the pressure to pour more and more money into it becomes, I think, enormous. And that I mean, it's that long term danger I think that I'm I'm more concerned about than you know in terms of whether whether such a system would work then whether it would work, you know, in the six months to two years right. after it's implemented. Well, there's also, and, you know, you add to that the outside possibility. I don't know how you estimate that probability. The system would just flat out work, and then you're definitely in trouble. So I then, guess, yeah, you know, sort of yeah. looking across that range of outcomes, maybe you're right. <laughs> they probably should fight it, and I suspect they will. Well, so I guess maybe we should finish up the conversation by talking about um, the, the, the real, really long-term trend since we've been sort of okay. talking, I guess, about the next five to ten years, but um, you've just published, I guess, a paper that's part of a series of papers that, um, is it that Pew is putting out? No, 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 not Pew. Uh, this is a joint Brookings American oh, Enterprise right. Brookings AI. I'm project sorry, yes. on the future of uh, red, blue, and purple America about these long-term demographic and geographic trends. And our conference, for anyone out there who's interested, is February 28th. 
open to the public. We'll have seven papers and uh, seven big change areas, and uh, we'll have some interesting people uh, discussing the papers. There'll be popcorn and party favors, so I urge everyone to come. So, but well, for those who can't come, though, uh, maybe maybe you could give a sneak preview. What what are the big changes? Uh, or well, what are, what are the big changes? Up. Well, let, let me ask you this: What are the big changes okay. that people don't expect? Because I think there are sort of baseline expectations that people have, like that the U.S. will become a more Hispanic country, right? I think I think most people see that as sort of an integral part of any future um, mm-hmm. for for the United States. So, what are what are some things that uh, blogging heads viewers might not expect? to change about American demographics and politics in the next 30 to 50 years? Well, you know, I mean, blogging heads, TV viewers are so sophisticated. It That's seems, true. No, that uh, is always likely our Unlikely to problem. me they wouldn't know about all of this stuff, at least a little bit. I mean, the theory of our conference is not to uh, uh, flag something that uh, nobody's ever heard of and we just discovered, but rather go into a lot of detail and depth about the changes that big changes that are happening that people are beginning to see and tease out their implications for politics and for the political parties over the long haul. So um, I could just run down them very briefly. Or uh, You know, there's first, we're, we're looking at uh, the rise of exurbia and the changing nature of suburbia. Second, we're looking at increased political homogeneity and communities, sort of the big sort, people tending to more uh, uh, live with like uh, politically. Uh, we're going to look at, of course, race. Uh, immigration and the next American people, the whole race ethnic change thing. We're going to look at the decline of the white working class, uh, something that we've uh, alluded to, at least the white working class, but the fact of the matter is these folks are a smaller and smaller proportion of the population. You have the rise of what you might call a mass upper middle class. 23% mm-hmm. of voters in the 2006 election had over $100,000 in household income. That's kind of interesting. Who are these people? How are they going to vote in the future? We're going to have a paper on changing family structure in the United States. Things like the majority of households in the United States now are unmarried. We'll look at the class divide and marriage and divorce. All kinds of things that are in terms of changes in terms of the way families are structured today and how kids are brought up and how kids enter adulthood and so on. We'll have a paper on uh, changing uh, patterns of religion and religious observance, the rise of secularism, at the same time as you have the strong evangelical component in politics, the religious divide, which is indeed with us today, at least the observance divide. Is that going to continue and in what form? And finally, very important, we could talk about this a little bit. This is kind of in the news. The rise of the millennial generation, uh, kids you might roughly peg as born between 1978 and 1996. We're now a uh, majority, uh, basically our 18 to 29-year-olds uh, today. Um, and the, you know, so the movement of boomers into the senior population. Uh, so all of these changes are dramatically reshaping uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, lot of, a lot of changes, I have to say. A lot of changes, and in fact, that's one of my... Maybe I should uh, ask you what's going to stay the same. You in emails, you look at these changes and you think, you know, how stable can it be uh, that we have, like, this closely divided politics? I mean, it seems like the net effect of all these big changes is going to have to push us somewhere, and certainly at minimum, uh, they're going to pose huge challenges to the political parties. Yeah, well, and I, I mean, I think, I guess to go get get back then to politics, I mean, Listening to you talk and having having skimmed over the paper, I mean, I think the you know given the way people vote today, nearly all of those trends seem more advantageous for the Democrats than for the Republicans. I think the way it looks now, the 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 decline, the the, if you if you tick through them, you know, if there is a continued decline in the marriage rate and you know a continued rise in both people delaying marriage, not having children at all, coming from um, you know uh, unmarried unmarried parents and so on, all of those people are, right now, people who are more likely to vote for the Democrats. Similarly, with the rise of, uh, you know, the, the Hispanic population, um, similarly with the uh, with the rise, well, I mean, I, you could actually go, well, let's talk about this for a second, the, 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 ri- the rise of sort of a more self-conscious secularism, which is something I've written about a little bit, I think you could mm-hmm. see cutting both ways, um, I, because mm-hmm. I think, you know, it's still... A, a relatively small percentage of the population, and while in some sense, obviously, it does benefit the Democrats, you could imagine the Democratic Party continuing to have the problem they've had now, where they're identified too strongly with their secular minority, and therefore have a trouble trouble capturing the more religious uh, m- majority of voters. So maybe that's one trend. You know, if people think too much of the Democrats as the party of, say, Richard Dawkins, Christopher Hitchens, and Sam Harris... 
that that could be huh. you know even if there are oh, more there's a, more there's a locution to uh, to say to, with yeah and that's that's Except right the problem no, with that I mean, is nobody would know what you're talking about that's, that's well that's the problem you you can't you can't put it in a you know in a in a general election speech because people will be like Sam Sam who what you know you you have to just sort of straight out say that the Democrats are the party of godlessness but um, so yeah so that that one might be a trend that could. Um, advantage advantage the Republicans, but but by and large, and, and and millennials, I think you know if just sort of taking taking the my generation, I guess. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about what what you see as sort of the defining characteristics of the millennial generation politically? I think they probably benefit the Democrats as well, but. Yeah, um, sure. Actually, I have a long uh, report about this. I wrote with Pete Leiden and the New Politics Institute that's on their website called The Progressive Politics of the Millennial Generation, and it's got more data than you can shake a stick at in it, but I won't go over all of it, but just hit some high points. I mean, they're obviously much more socially liberal than uh, you know older cohorts. They're, uh, they're much more likely to be a secular and sort of more broadly spiritual in their religious observance as opposed to... Uh, more orthodox. They tend to be very oriented toward uh, the problem of global warming and the environment. They tend to be very suspicious of sort of U.S., overt U.S. attempts to remake and control the world. They kind of think the U.S. should work uh, together with allies and in a more, I guess, what we once called multilateral fashion. Kind of a bad word to use because nobody kind of knows what it means out there in the, uh, in the broader America, but you know what I mean, I think. So, um, they have that tendency in terms of the role of government. They see a, you know, they have actually an unusually positive role toward the potential role of government. They think government has a big role to play in solving America's problems. That doesn't mean they necessarily favor all big government programs, but it does mean they see government as having a really constructive role to play, even if at the same time they tend to be pretty cynical about the politicians who are currently running things. There's that tendency to think, you know, I may favor the Democrats, for example, but uh, all of these politicians are kind of uh, uh, tend to have their, uh, you know, their hand out too much, and they tend to be too bureaucratic, and, and so on. And you know, there's a lot of other things. Everybody knows how technical, technologically oriented this generation is. Uh, you know, to some extent, they're, uh, you know, they're, they're a child of the very changes in, in family structure that we right. were alluding to earlier. These are kids who are much more likely to be the product of divorce, uh, much less likely to be suspicious of uh, homosexuality, much. Uh, more likely to delay child rearing uh, until uh, later in life, uh, much less likely to kind of be an adult in the 1960s sense by the time they're age 30. There's just huge changes there. Um, you know, by age 30, the uh, you know, strong majority of, uh, of kids used to be, uh, you know, have, have their own job, be financially independent from the parents, have their own home, and so on and so forth. It's like under 50% today uh, have hit all those adult markers by the time they're, they're 30. So they're there are big changes, some of which are not overtly political, but a lot of which, you know, appear to push them in this direction of being more sympathetic to the Democrats and seeing the Republicans to some extent as a party of the old America um, that they don't want to identify with and whose orthodoxy, uh, sort of hardline right-wing orthodoxy and social issue they don't identify with, who are too willing to, uh, you know, sort of push people around in the world, don't take the problem of global warming seriously, uh, so on and so forth. Right. And that's why in 2006... Uh, the Democrats got a 60 to 38 majority among 18 to 29 year olds. I mean, I doubt if it'll hold at quite that level, but it does look like uh, this generation is leaning in a particular direction. And you can also see this on questions about party identification with the Democrats. Oh, yeah. Typically have a, a wide double digit lead on party ID over the Republicans among this, this age group. So, you know, well, I mean, as, uh, political scientists have, 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 you know, established over the years that if, uh, you know, if a cohort votes a certain way uh, several times and leans a certain way for a, you know, a period of years, uh, they're likely to take part of that at least into their, uh, into their uh, you know, when they get into middle age. So that's yeah, a, I mean, there's an assumption. It could be a long-term disadvantage, not just a short-term one. Right. I mean, there's an assumption that, and, you know, I think it's a fairly reasonable one that people do get somewhat more conservative as they get older. But it also is true that if you look at, if you look at, yeah, I, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but if you look at 18 to 29-year-old voting patterns, um, they were, you know, tended to be, for instance, very enthusiastic about uh, Ronald, you know, Ronald Reagan in the in, in in the 1980s, and like the Reagan generation started out voting for Reagan when they were my age and continued voting Republican right on through to a, yes, at least to a right certain extent. Mm -hmm. Right. So a, a generation that starts out voting for Obama is, you know, likely to continue doing the same thing, which also gets to why 
you know, sort of Republican, the Republican Reagan obsession is, is, is potentially such folly because, you know, you have a generation coming up now that, you know, they, they didn't live through the 70s. They don't remember the 70s. You know, I barely remember the 80s. <laughs> Yeah, right, right, right. So, yeah, so like, hey, let's get back to uh, Reagan era conservatism. I think it's just kind of a hump. Reaction. But it's also, yeah, but but it also, and I, I mean, in a sense, it suggests that that uh, you know, you know, there is just this ebb and flow in American politics, and that the the very successes of the Republican Party and the conservative movement made America safe for big government liberalism again, and that um, you know, and that in order for America to become uh, I guess safe for small government conservatism again. You have to wait for big government liberalism to run things for a while and screw up. So yeah, yeah. give us like thirty six years or so. Thirty six okay. years. All right. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, no, but I mean, and, and but the and the other thing to remember is, uh, you know, that that the the original collapse of big government liberalism was brought about by, you know, these. It, it wasn't it wasn't something that happened in the space of you know a couple elections and a couple people screwing up. It was. The combination of you know an enormous crime wave that spanned decades, you know, a, a, a disastrous foreign war. I mean, there were there were big things happening that made the original. Yeah, yeah. Rise and don't of, forget, very important is the uh, the change in, in the economy uh, in the seventies. Right, right. I mean, the, the post-war welfare state was designed to work with an economy that performed like the economy did between roughly forty-six and in the early 70s, and uh, once it stopped working that way, it, uh, it really just didn't benefit a lot of the uh, you know supporters of the Democratic coalition, particularly these white working class voters we've been talking about. So in addition to a lot of these voters feeling uh, kind of out of sorts about the way the country was changing socially and too many things going to extremes and so on, uh, busting up the traditional order, I think they felt uh, the Democratic-oriented welfare state just wasn't delivering the goods anymore, and that really... Uh, took the props out from underneath the, the coalition. So, and that's why, I mean, looking forward, fast forward, if the Democrats can, or the Republicans for that matter, can reestablish a sort of political economic regime that can deliver the kind of benefits and the kind of growth uh, that um, were delivered in the, the post war era up until the early 70s, I mean, that should provide a pretty secure foundation for a coalition going forward. And conversely, if you can't do that, I think that does make coalitions pretty unstable because, in the end, people are pretty pragmatic. Uh, they're pretty materially oriented, and uh, if you don't, uh, you know, deliver for them, uh, they they will judge you, and at least the medium run. Yeah, I mean, I think one big question though is whether, uh, you know, if if some of the dire predictions about globalization's impact on the American workforce come true. Whether even if the Democratic Party isn't delivering, it'll still build increased support for a more left-wing economic regime, welfare state, and so on. I mean, I, I guess you could have you could have expected that that would have would have happened in the 70s. That the the failure of the post-war welfare state to reckon with the changes in the 70s could, in theory, have inspired a still more left-wing politics. And I think that's what a lot of people expected. In the 70s, but it, it didn't happen. It bred support for a more conservative yeah, it didn't politics. Happen. And maybe it, it couldn't have happened, you know, for a variety of reasons. I think we're in a different uh, position now. I, you know, this is going to be a long and boring policy discussion, but I think there are ways of managing uh, the transition in this new economic era that would stabilize things uh, for, for people in America and provide a a more a different kind of growth regime where people really do benefit broadly from from the way the country's going, and we continue to engage with the world and not withdraw from it. But you know, it'll take some doing to get there, and I think in a way that's the that's the big prize for both. They parties. always always yeah, it always takes some doing to get there. Well, uh, yeah. W w so without having this turn into a boring policy discussion, then maybe we yeah, should, yeah we don't want. <laughs> well, so we should maybe we should wrap things up at this point, having covered both parties and the future, and talk for an hour or so. So. It's been a pleasure, Roy, and uh, I hope we can do this again. It's been delightful, Ross. I look forward to it. All right. Talk to you soon. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.